Hi, my name is Earl Basden. Join me on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. on 1450 AM Gold for VSB Sports Talk to get all your sporting news. You will have the chance to hear about the many wonderful things our Bermudian athletes are doing both locally and abroad. That's Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays on 1450 AM Gold from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. for VSB Sports Talk with Earl Baisden. Uh, joining me on set here at VSB Sports Talk is none other than the Director of Youth and Sport, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Norbert Simons. Good afternoon, Mr. Basin. Good afternoon, Bermuda. Uh, I'm glad to have you here um, to answer uh, and discuss um, several things. Number one, uh, the state of sport in Bermuda. Uh, number two, um, what's the future hold for sports in Bermuda? Another subject we want to get onto is the Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. sports awards, and uh, obviously the sports policy. Um, first things first, let's, let's discuss the state of sports, coming, f coming out of your office, the state of sports in, in and around the island. Mr. Beeson, that's a good question. Um, in general, I think the state of sports is in, in, in fairly good shape. Uh, there's always going to be the question that there's not enough funding. Mm -hmm. um, so from a financial point of view, I think that our sports programs are not as healthy as they can be, but I think that for what they have and what they're trying to accomplish, they're doing extremely well. When, when we, because everyone always talks about the finance part of it, and the, the and I guess whenever you talk to people, it's always the lack thereof. Mm -hmm. In a perfect world, uh, we'll we'll be printing money and we'll be able to give money all willy nilly. Your office is charged with. A budget and disseminating that that those funds to the necessary uh, sporting governing bodies as they request. How is that? How how do you determine that? I know you have a team of people that dis sit around the table and discuss what what is what is a definite, what is uh, possible, and what because obviously national sports governing bodies have the have dream lists as well of yep. what they hope to do for the coming year. How do you determine what's possible, impossible, no way? Okay, Earl, in the perfect world, we give them everything they ask for. Right. Because that means that we get everything that we ask for. Uh -huh. um, obviously, when we go through the budget process, as we are right now, um, we, ask each national, we ask each national sports governing body to present to us their financial proposal for the upcoming fiscal year. And that request was to be in at the end of July or August, um, which will give us time to go through it. Now, what we'll do is that we'll tally up the total amount of grants as requested, and we'll make submission for that total amount. Uh, realistically, we know that um, given the current economic climate, and even if it was a really good climate, um, we recognize that we're not going to get it all. So once we are told how much money we get, to allocate towards grants, then we will go through the grant packages and look at what the proposals are. And given that our criteria is that um, we will try to provide funding for the development of the sport. Mm -hmm. And the development of the sport includes not only the athletes, but the development of coaches, the development of the administration as well. So, but we would target that area. Um, we're not going to look to try and provide money to pay your rent. Mm -hmm or things of that nature, but we will try and at some point in time identify what you've identified with um, talent um, you know, development and then we'll, we'll attempt to try and meet those, need, meet those needs. I know you said you, you work out a time frame. What, what is the time frame of finding out what your budget's going to be month-wise? And But you say um, you try to have everybody in by July, August. Yeah, you see, we have to, um, um, finance was sent down a uh, a timetable of, of certain things that we have to have in place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not going to get into the technical part right, of it. Right. But, um, and then our ministry would indicate to us our time frames because our, their time frame is usually before finance because we, like you say, we're part of a ministry. Right. Now, um, in, in the past um, year, we were given an allocated a month for the ministry. Mm -hmm. 
And so each department in the ministry will battle for what they feel they need. Right. But, you know, given circumstances, we have to be realistic about what we can get. But nine times a ten, finance will tell us at the end of the day, um, this is what your budget is going to be. And then we would have to sit down and determine where we're going to allocate funding. Now, we know that X number of dollars will go to grants, mm -hmm. not only just the sports grants, but the uh, youth grants as well. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have to look at how we're going to match up our other programs that we offer, as long as we keep in, you know, keep in line with the amount of money that we're given. So what will happen is, is that when we present our budget, and when the final budget comes out, we know that mm -hmm. we're on the same time as when the uh, minister makes a presentation to the to the country. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, your your youth. I want to get the name right. The youth. Athletes uh, sponsorship grant. Um, yeah, national, 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 yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. We know that that number lowered. Yes. Um, and and I know one of your one of your driving forces behind that is the the need to to make sure that the youth get as much support as possible. Yes. How does that sit? Currently, with with uh, obviously we know what economic state we are in, mm -hmm. um, but how does that sit with with the message that you see coming from government to what you're trying to accomplish? Well, you know, I think that um, we have to be cognizant and and, and aware of the fact that um, there's only so much money going around, mm -hmm. and as a country, um, we have to determine what the priorities are right. uh, and where we fit. And even though that's a mantra of mine, that um, we have to try and develop our young people, um, you will be reminded that uh, a few years ago it was at $25,000. Mm -hmm. We moved it up to fifty, then we moved it up to seventy-five. dollars you know, Then as a result of the economic crunch, everybody had to take a hit, so we dropped it back to $50,000. And what we try to do is um, meet the needs of one athlete from each national sport, right. especially those that apply. Remember that the national sports government body has to apply. Right. And last year, I believe we had about 14 applications, and mm -hmm. we we met, we assisted in some way, shape, or form with all 14. Right. So that's, and our goal is that we want to give away the entire $15,000, not give it away, but give it towards the development. Right. Plan. But let, let me let me add this caveat that um, the funds that we give. The national sports government bodies have to provide us with a report, mm -hmm. usually around February, to indicate that they have done what they did with the money. If they wanted to do some other, if they said they wanted to take an athlete to IMG in Florida right. for a training program, and that fell through, and they said, well, we found one in Oregon, just as an example, right. they will now have to write back to our office and we'll present it to the committee to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. Should they not use those monies, then they have to return them back to the department. Right. And how often does that happen? How often does they, uh, is it that, the, the, the flip side, where something falls through and they find another um, camp or, or development program that they can go to that they eventually don't go to? How often they don't, that, it, that they don't go to the original one? Right. It happens. And, and the committee yeah. decides, okay, we're, we don't accept you going to the other. Uh, nine times out of ten, if it's if it's a reputable program, mm -hmm. then the committee will, the chairman of the committee will will advise us that, that that's that they support the grant request. Okay, now let's talk about let's move on to uh, the future of sport, uh, not only in Bermuda but Bermudians abroad. We see a lot of our youngsters in various sports in colleges around the world um, doing major things, both. Mm -hmm on the field, in classrooms. What What is the future uh, in, uh, coming, well, the direction in which your office is taking? The future of sport? Well, we, we, by all, I think that the best way to answer the question is that we recently developed a national sports public to try to set up a roadmap for sport in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and our intent was to try and bring sport to the fore mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and give it uh, uh, its proper representation in place in, in, in the community mm -hmm. 
and with, quite frankly, with, you know, as we see more and more of our young people going off to school to for sports or whatever the case may be, um, you know, we see nothing but being good. The intent of uh, uh, what we would like to see is that we would like, we, as a country, we have to be realistic. Um, right. By sheer numbers, by sheer numbers, right. um, to provoke, to produce professional athletes of the standards of uh, Clyde Pass, Sean Gooder, and the like, it's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. When you see that um, in England, uh, when you look at the amount of players that are playing football from juniors all the way up. Mm -hmm. Is twice the amount of people that exist in this country. Right. So realistically, realistically, uh, we feel that the best thing that we can do is to develop our athletes to use their skills to get a college degree, mm -hmm. and from there, the sky's the limit. They right. can either graduate from university with a degree and come back to the community, or the, someone will see them with their skills and be offered a professional contract in the United States or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So, but realistically, you know, we have to provide the opportunity for them to gain an education and also for those that are capable of uh, becoming professional, we must provide that opportunity as well. Mm. Now, it, we see it all the time because you, you also work with youngsters at a track club. Mm -hmm. um, you yourself was involved in track and field. But we see more and more, especially our young men, struggling with the academic side of, of life. Um, how do we how do we kind of marry the two? Because we have some very talented sportsmen and and young ladies, but they struggle on the, the academic. academic side. Oh, it's 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 not a unique situation just to Bermuda. No, I know that for sure. Um, world over, our women are excelling. Our females are excelling, mm -hmm. and and if you look at the the table it's, it's tilting where more females are excelling not only in education and also are excelling other boys. Mm -hmm. But as a former educator, um, we have to take in consideration that we have to teach our boys a little differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say that, or I mean I think that we have to find what makes them tick. I know that for me, yeah, maybe I'm a bad example, but you know I was really good at math and English all of the subjects and then when you get about 14 years old you start questioning your teachers. Right. Uh, I recall asking my teacher why do I need to do algebra because as far as I'm concerned all I need to know is that um, if I gave me a $20 and I'm supposed to get and the item came to $16 I need to get $4 back in change. Right. But when I went to university because I did PE at that mm -hmm. um, it came a point where in order for me to graduate I had to do biomechanics. And in that biomechanics, I had to do trigonometry. Right. And, you know, all of that type of stuff. Yeah. And that's when I realized that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this is important. Because the first test I took, I think I got six out of 20. I said, no, no, this, this ain't happening. Got your $14 so, back? <laughs> yeah, I got my $14 back. So, you know, I engaged the help of one of the tutors in the program. And, you know, because now that it made sense to me, because it, 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 it it talked about movement, scalar, vector quantities, and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, angular momentum and all this type of thing. Right. So that made sense to me. Right. And because it made sense to me, I was able to grasp the subject, and the next time I took the exam, I got 19 out of 20. Right. You know, so I'm saying, so what we have to do now is to find ways to, what triggers and holds the imagination, not only of our boys, but of a lot of our girls. Because right. if it doesn't make sense to them, then, you know, they're not going to really want to learn it. They're going to question because. When you got about 14 years old, you know, it's, it, whether we like it or not, that's when what we say, our parents say you're starting to smell yourself. Yes. And so you're trying to find your identity. Mm -hmm. And some of us take that questioning as being rude. Right. And kick them out of class. Right. But what we now need to do is to start to engage them. Because I noticed that even when I was teaching, that when we talked about football, if I, if I refer to um, the, the circumference of a football and tell them to go find it out, they would come back and give me the answer. Right. But if I told them, um, the radius of a circle. <laughs> I'm yeah. not interested. You almost in have that. to put it in terms almost, that makes yeah. it interesting for them. Yeah, you almost I know have to. The, the other challenging thing is that a lot of our, our young men, mm -hmm. and maybe even young ladies, um, get to an age like 10, 11, 12, where they're almost embarrassed 
because to, to ask a question in class yeah. because they think people's gonna laugh at them yeah. that because they don't know. So they they would sit there and not ask it and not ask it as opposed to asking the question and yeah. getting the answer, get yeah. what you need. You but know? but you see, Earl, we you know the one thing is that um, we have to tell our children that. If you're thinking it, so is somebody else. Right. And they're in the same predicament that you are. They're not going to ask that question. Right. And they must be, you know, they must be encouraged to understand that the only stupid question is the one not asked. That's right. That's right. And, and, and I think that we have to be, you know, in, in that type of arena, we have to be a little bit more patient. Mm -hmm. And when they start asking why, because at three years old, they start asking why. As much as, why that, mama? Why that? Right. You know, and it gets on your nerves. Right. But, you know, if you don't answer them, then you discourage them from learning. From, yeah. So from, from that early stage, when they start asking all these questions, then we must be prepared to answer them. I mean, you know, we don't have to be, you know, complicated by the answer, but right. a little short answer but that, that, and that, um, that makes them inquisitive. Because in, in, inquisitiveness is, is the first step to learning. So right. we must encourage that from an early age. And when they hit those teen years, when they're really testy, sometimes we have to step back and think about what we were like as mm -hmm. a teenager. And so, then, you know, we'll be able to get through this, I think. You know. Right. Uh, you're listening to VSB Sports Talk. I'm your host, Earl Basin. I'm joined here with the Director of Youth and Sport, Mr. Norbert Simons, and we're just discussing the state of sport in Bermuda, uh, our upcoming Hall of Fame, sports policy, uh, Athletes of the Year, uh, just sport in general. Um, Mr. Simons, that, that sports policy um, has been a, what I want to call a elastic band for for about two and a half years now, pretty much longer. Longer, okay. Um, I remember us talking about that some time ago. Mm -hmm. um, you've you've met with the national sports governing bodies. We've we met the minister and uh, a lot of dialogue and a lot of information that's going into it. Um, where are we at as far as that being ruled out? Well. Earl, uh, just before cup match, the minister made an official presentation for the policy and, and wrote it on that. So we are now in the process of developing the action plan, you know, the committees for the action plan. Right, right. If you recall at our conference in February, we talked about a draft policy. Right. And we formed action committees, right? Mm -hmm. but, but what we did was we had to take a step back and review the policy. And I hope is that, you know, after the minister ruled out that we want to present it to the National Sports Governor, but this again, form the action committee so we can start developing our short, medium, and long-term goals. Mm -hmm. so what time school, frame do we have with that? Well, we're starting, we've already started the process, so we're reaching out to, we will be reaching out to the National Sports Governor, but we recognize that July and August, everybody's on vacation, everybody's caught up in the match and the like, and mm -hmm. all that is time. So we're starting to, our hope is that by the end of October, will be in full flow and so by December we want to make we, you know we want to have at least the first phase of it done so that when we meet with the National Sports Company by in February we can make a presentation on, on the proposals going forward. Now I remember that because I was at the the, the function at Hamilton Princess mm -hmm. and a lot of different scenarios from various other sports mm -hmm. um, having having all as many as you could possibly get at, at a sports conference, the national sports governing bodies, how much is that valuable? Earl is really valuable. I think that sitting there when we made that presentation, it, it, it felt good to know that um, we were finally getting buy-in. I think that the biggest challenge of the past couple of years is is trying to develop that trust. I think that you know, I think that a lot of our national sports governing bodies, for whatever reason, there's a degree of mistrust, not only of of us as a department, mm -hmm. but I think even of each individual group, because one sees one getting more than yes, the other, yes. and so it becomes this antagonism and, and not understanding. So what we've always tried to do is to, 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 to encourage that communication, because if one group is doing something extremely well, then share it with the other so they could all be at the same level. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that discussion that we had, not only then, but the one we had in October, um, was uh, encouraging. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we continue the effort, then I think that sports will benefit as a result of it. All right. The number to dial is 295-1450. And let's, let's talk a little bit about, get, let's get into the sports policy. Um, reason behind having it? Well, I became director in 2006, and we recognized that 
the last policy wasn't done since 1980. But obviously, you know, you know, I had to spend some time to learn my position and, and feel comfortable with myself in the new position because obviously when you're on the outside looking in, you always think it's easy Yes. until you get there. And so yes. it was a question of just really trying to um, get one, get comfortable with my position and, and get to know the players mm -hmm. a little better. Mm -hmm. And what we did do was that we had former a student that came in. Let me let me back up a little bit. When we first reached out to the National Sports Company, but it's like I said, there was a degree of mistrust and nobody wanted to share information mm -hmm. like you know, and, and understand what it is. And so what we did do is we got one of our a student that came in and who was doing a, a sports management program mm -hmm. and he, he was charged with you know, as part of his um, development, right. he was charged with going out to meet with the National Sports Company and, and gathering information. And um, we used that information. And then, you know, as we moved on, we looked at not only our national policy, the policy that was done in 1981 and the white people and the green people on sport, mm -hmm. we looked at other jurisdictions as well. So we just went on, on the internet and pulled on uh, policies from Great Britain, from Australia, from New Zealand, from the Caribbean, mm -hmm. various, you know, Jamaica, various different island, islands in the Caribbean. So we had a bind real thick that, and looked at those policies and said, what can we use in these policies? But mm -hmm. we needed to make sure that it had the Bermuda intent and flavor. I knew what I wanted. Right. And um, once we had the discussion with our staff, I knew to get buy-in because you got to get buy-in at every level. So. Right. Right. And but I didn't want it to be just my ideas. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to include what the other means are because, like you said, I've been involved, involved in sports for a long time, and I see some challenges that they have. So what? I didn't want to make it about me, I wanted to make it about the country because mm -hmm. I knew that at the end of the day, um, it's, it's a country policy. Right. So once we did all of that, um, we then got someone to draft it for us, okay? Right. You know, we sat down with them, shared our ideas, right. got someone to draft it for right. us, brought it back and presented it to our staff mm -hmm. and to the minister. Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, our staff picked it apart, Right. you know. Um, it was, you know, whether you like it or not, it's difficult to be criticized about your ideas about it was important. Right. So we picked it apart. We made another presentation, and then we had a round table discussion. Right. After picking it apart, we made a round table discussion and presented, the, you know, the, a brief outline about what the policy was about and looked at what the National Sports Government bodies would okay. like to see and what they want. And we went back, put everything together, and this is a document that we have now. Mm. Okay. And obviously the challenge, uh, you've already said it, mm -hmm. is one that um, some always feel other sports get mm -hmm. more, mm -hmm. um, but how do they, how do they um, balance that mm -hmm. in regard to what's my needs as opposed to what's... My wants. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And, and once I think people involved in national sports governing bodies realize that, mm -hmm. I think collectively they can all move forward. Yeah, and exactly, because I think that for the last little while we've always been trying to encourage them to look at a four-year plan. Right. You know, present us with a four-year plan, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I use a four-year cycle, and, I, and, and you could, I guess you could understand the logic behind this, that a four-year cycle because the Olympics is every four years, yes. the World Cup is every four years, yes. cricket and football, mm -hmm. um, and uh, most sports have a four-year cycle, yeah. and, 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 and if you're in swimming and like, your four-year cycle will include the Olympics as, right. the, as the pinnacle. Right. And I'm going to use swimming and, and in track and field as an example. Um, the Olympics was just last year. When was it last? 2012. 2012 right? yeah. So yeah. the following year you would have the CECs. Mm -hmm. The following year you'd have it, it's the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Then you have the Pan Ams and the CEC Games. Right. And then the Olympics. Right. And in between there are other meets. And so right. if you could start, if we could start getting the habit about this is where we want to be, right. and where our athletes to be. Mm -hmm then we will be in a better place to, then you can determine better how, how best you want to accept, you know, deal with the finance because, you know, it doesn't make sense saying that you want $250,000 in year one. And when it comes to the Olympics, you only want $100,000, maybe, you know, I don't know, but I'm just right. saying you determine what development is needed for you to get to that ultimate right. place. When you, when, you, when you hear of our youngsters and see their names everywhere, 
are doing well, both locally and internationally. Mm -hmm. We can name off uh, Quick Three, Jesse, mm -hmm. Tyler, and and uh, uh, Runner. Uh, highest greatest. Mm -hmm. The 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 need to try and get them a higher level of competition on a regular basis. How how can your office? assist in that regard. Well again you see the national sports governing bodies will have to make the representation on what again it goes right back to a development plan. Right. right. Okay. Um, and it shouldn't not just be about those three that you named about because right. in that pool, in order for that for that in those individuals to get better, then the pool must also get better. Yes. yes. So we must look at how we're going to get the whole pool to that level. Mm -hmm. You know, and not just that one person. Right. So, um, again, it comes right back down to a developmental plan, uh -huh. a, a plan on what they need and, and identify. And that's when we talk about the policy about developing a roadmap mm -hmm. for their athletes, then that's what it speaks to. It's right. about, you know, then you know that in year one, this is where they need to be. Year two, this is where they need to be. These are the steps that are necessary to get them to the place and then course it out. Which now means that we all have to change the way we think. Right, right. You know, it's about a mind shift now so that if, if, if we start planning things out, then we can say, well, how can we best assist you to get there? Mm -hmm. Not only just the government, because you can't just rely on government right. to assist there. Right. But I think that if you, if you start seeing a clear roadmap and you start meeting those targets, then I see the um, corporate, corporate sector being a little bit more cooperative in, 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 in right. funds. Right. The, the fact that we have uh, an elite program through the Bermuda Olympic Association, mm -hmm. um, could we actually see uh, a collaborative effort between, um, I want to say, government and the BOA to assist more? I know they, they get a grant from the IOC. Well, we give them a grant as well. And you give them athletes. a grant, yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Unfortunately, it was cut, but right. we provide them funding for elite athlete development. But personally, what I would like to see happen is that we need to provide funding for the developmental athletes yes. to get them to the to elite the, status. Right, right, right. And, and I think that that's going to be something that, you know, with the partnership with the National Sports Government what is if we can get them to, to start laying out again that roadmap, mm -hmm. and then we can create an argument for additional funding for that, right. then I think that, you know, we can do that. Because my concern is that we, like you say, we give some funding for development, mm -hmm. but what happens to the athlete between that early development and the elite status. How many have we lost right. as a result of not being able to target them and the like? Um, we always target the one that excels early, you know, right. the early bloomer. Yes. But in that group, there's always late bloomers who yeah. may be better than that one that started off right. early. So we have to find ways to, you know, to get them from that development stage to elite status. Mm -hmm. And that's usually between the ages. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get land basis for it. I'm going to say that critical age between 14 and 18. Mm -hmm. So we have to find ways. Because some sports, um, their elite athletes can be 14. Right. right. You know, but I think that to get them from that place to that place, you know, and so that we can have not only have they experience success mm -hmm. athletically, but we increase and improve their personal wealth and self-esteem. Self right. Now, let's compare when you were coming along. Uh, running beside some heavy names uh, in Bermuda's track and field. Um, compared to what you guys had back in your day of training as compared to what these youngsters have today in order to develop, well, how would you compare the two? It's Jordan G, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, our, our athletes have, they have everything, I think, I think that. In comparison to us, we, you know, like I said, we, you know, we trained on grass. Mm -hmm. um, when we went to Carifta, we had to walk from one end of the island to raise money. Uh, I think that, and there's no criticism. I right, think that, right. I think that looking back at it, we produced world-class athletes mm -hmm. in the 70s, I think that, you know, you know, and I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about Cal, Dio, David Jarrett. Greg B. Simon, Dennis Trott, mm -hmm. Mike Shaw, um, and I'm, I'm just going to track and right, right. But also in football and cricket, yes, yeah. we were producing world-class athletes. Mm -hmm. 
And one has to understand why that happened. I think that times are different. Yeah. Um, we had a point to prove. Mm -hmm. um, and I say we had a point to prove because most of us were black. Right. And you know, for us, it was just coming out of that era, and I'm young enough and old enough to remember where segregation was important. You know, because you know, I think my year was one of the first years that when didn't have to pay for high school. Ah. You know, okay. My first year we were supposed to pay for high school, but after that we didn't pay to go to high school after right. that. You know, so and for us, the social the social climate was right. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we didn't have a whole lot of distractions. Right. Okay? And right. And, you know, and I think that we, we tend to forget that we you know, there was maybe one or two T V channels. Yeah. Um going outside was what was required. Punishment was staying in and right. watching everybody do everything. So right. we were able to hone our skills in the playground from young. Mm -hmm. um, our generation, these our, our children today, um, there are other distractions. I think right. there are other um, good, bad, and indifferent. Um, we've created technology has created a, a, a different type of attitude. Yes. Um, and I say that because with technology. And, 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 and people cried for easier ways to do it. Nobody yeah. wanted to wash clothes by hands anymore, so yeah. you had to create a washer. Right. But every time you cry about you want more things to make life easier, you're putting people out of work. Right. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you develop a computer and machines to do the work that 10 people can do, well, so there's the upsides and the downsides. But for our, for our children, it's, it's about self-gratification, and they got it without having to work hard for mm -hmm. it. Um, and I say that because there were things that we had to work hard for. Well, we had to work hard to go to school. Right. We had to work hard to go on a trip. We had to work hard to even get uniforms. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that um, um, the uniform that we had for, for um, um, Corifta, uh the big blue machine, was used, used it as well. And I know that because one of them came to my house to get mine. <laughs> and I was irritated, you know what I'm saying? But we were sharing, and so right. there was a more, a more collaborative and more relationship. But I refer to this generation as the microwave generation. Mm -hmm. Everything is instant. Right. Um, they're not understanding that the they have the skills. To work for it. Yeah, they have the skills. There's, there's no question the skills and the ability. Mm -hmm. But I challenge their mindset and their will. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there was more of us around us who had the will to be successful for, right. for various reasons. Right. Um, I said to one of my athletes this week. I said, I don't question your ability. I question your desire, mm -hmm. you know, because in training you can do these things and then you get in the meet and you don't even come close to what you do in training. So no, it's not a question of ability, it's, a, it's a, your whole mental approach. Mm -hmm. And so, especially for our girls in this day, day and age, it is not fashionable for them to be in sports. It's still fashionable for boys to be in sports. Yes, yes. Mine, you know, there are other distractions which are not healthy. Right. But we have some really outstanding young females mm -hmm. in this country right. in every sport right. who can who can be world beaters. Right. But when you hear girls say to them about yes, yeah, yes, you heard on the place when you you know I mean those things are important to a man and we can't take that from it. But, right. But we have to find a way to make them understand that these these tools that they have can open doors for them. Right. I, 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 like, like I said to the other day in the meeting, I said, um, um, with the talent that you have, somebody's prepared to pay you $50,000 a year to go to university mm -hmm. and get educated. Mm -hmm. At the end of your four years, you've earned almost a quarter of a million dollars. Right. Yeah. And I think that's how we have to know, break it down to them. Because you need to understand, because everybody's about money and stuff, right? right. I said, if your parents had to pay that $50,000 a year, you ain't good. Right. You know, and you know, and unfortunately, um, and that's where we start losing people. And I think that if we can get our, our children to understand that, okay, you could be a professional athlete, but if you work hard at your academics, work hard at your, your skills, mm -hmm. then you will get a scholarship. And especially our females right. will get it easier than the boys. To go to university, right. so you know, I'm saying, uh, if somebody's going to pay you fifty thousand dollars a year to run up and down, and then until you go to school, then you have to maintain your grades, and at the end of four years, you come up with a degree, right? That you, that your, that your 
skills got you and your parents saved that kind of money and if your parents were able to save that money and give it to you at the end of, at the end of four years, you have a start in life yes. that most of us never hear. Yeah. Now we know, we know uh, the Hall of Fame has been revamped, um, it's come back to life. Uh, I knew it was a disappointment for you to have to um, put it to the side due to the economic issues, mm -hmm. but now that it's come back, how are we shaping up for uh, the, the 2015 edition? <laughs> well, Earl, I, ha I, ha I will say that uh, the committee is meeting tonight. Mm -hmm. And they will start the deliberations to build on how many they're going to induct into the Hall of Fame. And so it's looking quite good right now. Right. You know, I think that, um, yes, it's been a little disappointing because we think that this is important. But obviously, um, you know, right. priorities. We have yes. to realize that we're not in this world by ourselves. Right. And that there are other pressing issues that, are, uh, that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And so we have to play our part as well. So, you know. We we're trying to do it again this year, so mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it's going to come back next year because we don't know where we're going to be. Right. So but true. we're going to try and do this this come this year. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, everybody always talks about having a location for people to see those people that have been inducted and having. Uh, how how are we shaping up with with that regard? Having um, a a. A place. place. A place? Yeah. Where, I mean, you get, you get, whenever you go on a trip and you go to a, say, a baseball mm -hmm. or football, who, now, in, in the United States, they have individual Hall of Fames for their sports. Right. In Bermuda, we're, we're putting them all together, which I know you and I had a good discussion about the fact that individual national sports governing bodies should be hosting their own. Um, but and unfortunately, they don't. So yeah. it's it's almost, and people complain. People yes. complain that the government doesn't do anything mm -hmm. about it. But in reality, when you want to go to the NFL Hall of Fame, you literally go to the NFL, NFL Hall, of Hall, of Hall of Fame. Same thing with baseball. Yeah. Same thing with football. Same mm -hmm. thing. So I know it it becomes a financial burden, mm -hmm. but the fact that. We've now started it in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. How can we then make it and or find an area where um, I can take my sons and say, "I want let's go and see who's been inducted into the Hall of Fame," and and these people can actually their families. It'll be a place that their families will cherish that the fact that father, brother, uncle, cousin is in the Hall of Fame, and we can go in and and show it off, kind of thing. Um, on a regular basis? Mr. Biz, and that's on our bucket list. <laughs> uh, and I see it on our bucket list before we retire. Um, Cal Simons and I talk about it all the time. Right. You know, it, it's a passion, especially of Cal, that mm. we try and find a place. Uh, we've thrown out a few fields, um, but again, you see, it's just one step at a time. The current economic climate. Right. Um, do you need to, I mean, you have to weigh the situation. Do we build a Hall of Fame and to display me. our athletes and, 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 and not try to concentrate on finding jobs for people. I mean, I'm not a politician, so right. I'm not even going to entertain that. But I think that, you know, I think that from a country's point of view, I think right. that what's, what's the priority right now? Right. I think that, you know, and I think that, and I want you to know that it is a priority for us to try and get it done, but it's, it's one of those priorities that we put on our wish list, and I'm going to say a bucket list because mm -hmm. Before we retire, we hope that it happens. Right. Um, we've looked at a few, we've asked about a few facilities, but again, it's a question of having the money to to uh, set it up mm -hmm. and the money to maintain it right. and the money to, to run it. I think that a lot of times we always talk about having having these facilities, but we're only concerned about building, but we never talk about maintaining them right. and the upkeep. Right. And then we run into problems. Yeah. So I think that what we would like to do, we would like to find a place, and, that, and I'm not saying that it's not important because from a sporting point of view, it's very important, and mm -hmm. that's why uh, uh, my predecessor and those you know, that came before me thought that the whole thing was really important and it started. But, you know, and it is important, mm -hmm. and when I say that, we need to do things more, as far as I'm concerned, to highlight the accomplishments of our people mm -hmm. so they can feel better about themselves and feel, and not just say you're proud of your community, but this is why I'm proud of you for meeting. Right. So I think that it is important, but 
again, it's about priorities. Right. And and having, I must say, having the, the Hall of Fame is an inspiration yes. for those that, that haven't been nominated mm -hmm. or put forward, that eventually their accomplishments mm -hmm. uh, will be recognized in some way, shape, or form. Um, the last inductee ceremony, um, you just about everybody that went up on the stage thanked other people that helped get them, them yes. you know, to where they are, and and you that that resonated for the entire evening. That mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't be standing here if not for A, B, and C, and and. Although those people won't get, or have yet to get, that recognition of, of a Hall of Fame award, because their name was mentioned by the person getting it, that, that makes them feel proud that their, that, that their accomplishments um, was recognized and helped that person. Mm -hmm. So they feel a part of it. You know, a lot of people, um, when, when, they, when they go up on the stage, you, you feel um, their teammate or, you know, the coach or somebody sits there and says, you know what, I'm proud enough to know that I helped that person get there. And, and I think that only helps the person in the crowd and those on the outside looking in. Now, I know the first time we had the, the Hall of Fame, everybody was up in arms with the fact that our only uh, Olympic, Olympic medalist was not in the first Ten. Mm -hmm. uh, now, even I said, okay, if you're putting ten in, okay, you only have to pick nine because <laughs> it's a given. Yeah. But we've grown past that. Mm -hmm. um, now, you you said that uh, you, they will decide how many, so mm -hmm. there's a possibility they could be more than ten, no, less than ten. But it could either be we can go up to ten. Up to ten. Okay, so maybe five and maybe ten. Okay. Okay, yeah. so um, we will know on the night. Okay. okay. All right. But even to your point, Mr. Bears, and I think that what's important about uh, recognizing the accomplishments of people is the message that you send to young people that are aspiring as well as that, you know, you know, your hard work is not in vain. You right. will be recognized. I think, and I, and I say that because um, while in Bermuda we tend to forget our heroes, right. but you get into other jurisdictions, um, they still talk about all of the heroes. Clyde that's still revered in, in, in England today, so right. you know, it's important. Right. Mr. Bearson is a, um, I recognize that a lot of people have stayed away from sport because of uh, antisocial behavior of a few. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, I'm going to throw this out, there's a, there's a saying that evil prevails and good men sit back and do nothing. Right. And so, man, we sit back and then say, well, we're waiting for somebody else to do than those that are out there feel that they have the right to do what they do. Mm -hmm. But instead of just going home, I think we need to start getting back out there and, and say, hey, this is enough. You know, I think it's right. not it's not something that is just a police issue. It's not something that is just uh, a sport club or an association issue. It's, it's a countrywide issue, and I think that we have we have abdicated our responsibility mm -hmm. when we when we walk away and turn a blind eye to what's going on. Um, you know that we need to make a decision about what it is that we want to accomplish and not just look at the next person to do it for us. Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 you know, I see both sides of this. Mm -hmm. I see both sides of the spectrum. And I think um, if, we, if we collectively came out and addressed it mm -hmm. um, at the early stage, I, I know I, I, I just this past weekend, um, I was at a, a football game and a person that I respect in the community, we were having a conversation, mm -hmm. and we were standing by ourselves for mm -hmm. a long period of time, and then all of a sudden, some youngsters came over, and um, just one stood out, you know, got verbal, got loud, mm -hmm. and the person I was standing next to just quietly said to him, maybe, maybe this isn't the place for you right now. You, know, you, you don't seem like you're here for, mm -hmm. to watch this, you, you seem like you're here for something else. And eventually the, the young man got the message and he left. But his friends stayed there. They enjoyed it. And, yeah. And, and, and y you could hear a little bit of the communication was that, you know, I'm tired of hanging around because it's all negative. It's all negative. Mm -hmm. It's all negative. You know, so it, because it was addressed, 
and it was it wasn't an aggressive manner in yeah. which it was addressed. It was you know maybe maybe this isn't the place for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's all in the delivery. Yeah, yeah, and and the yeah. message was yeah. conveyed, kind sort of yeah. thing, yeah. and problem problem solved. Yeah, you know. You know. Um, before we do go, we do want to talk about the sports awards, twenty fourteen. Yes, that's going to be. It's been a big year. Yes, it has, and I think Earl, we have we have started to plan for it already. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking for someone to. Um, we haven't made an official, but we've started in the office to discuss it and looking at um, finding someone to assist us with producing the uh, program. Because mm -hmm. as you state that, um, there's a lot of things that we have to do, mm -hmm. and a lot of work goes into it. Um, right. Contrary to what people think sometimes, well, oh yeah, oh, there's yeah. a lot of work that goes into it. And, and I said to my colleague, I said, you know, sorry, you know. Um, you can't do all this by yourself. Right. It's, a, it's and, putting on yeah. a producing a an event yes. of, of that nature yes. takes yes. somebody concentrating on, on that. It. Yes. Uh, yeah. What you guys do in the office is facilitate many other yes. things. Having yeah, to manage that as well mm -hmm. is a burden because mm -hmm. you on that night. Uh, now I've been involved on the committee and a presenter for the last three years. Mm -hmm. And on that night, you have so many different things going on, so you can imagine what the lead up's like. Yeah. Um, rehearsal, uh, putting all the scripts together. Mm -hmm. You need you need someone who's going to really concentrate on that yeah. regard. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I, because I don't want to ask too many questions sure. about the back end of that uh, mm -hmm. of the, but having having the sports awards, mm -hmm. I know. Um, there was some talk about that may have to have taken a back seat as well, but I think amongst the committee was like, it ain't no way we're <laughs> we're not going to do that. Yeah. Uh, it was, and it was not just the committee. I think that um, from our point of view, um, we know that we have budget cuts, and I know that we'll take criticism for it, but this is important. Yes. As a department, I mean, we're the call of the Department of Youth, Sport, and Recreation, and um, this is one of our priorities. Mm -hmm. Um, we need to, again, in this current climate, we need to ensure that we talk about all of the positive things that are going on in the community. Um, there are so many great things going on in the sport. But what happens is, as you stated earlier, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Mm -hmm. So when something goes wrong, that becomes the highlight. Right. But that detracts away from the hard work that the children are putting into, the hard work that the parents are putting into, the coaches, the clubs, mm -hmm. the national sports government bodies, and I think that this is one night that we need to do what's necessary to ensure that they get under their record lines. Right. They do. Now, the other thing on that night, because I smile all the time, and whenever I'm challenged about it, I have one simple response, and quietly the person, the people go away. In order to be uh, selected as athlete of the year. What must one in the public do? They must put the name forward. And that's the bottom line. If the name is not put forward. And you, the committee can't. The committee can only uh, the committee can only discuss what's before them. Right. I know that in many of meetings we say why did why wasn't this person put forward? But the committee cannot put it forward. Okay, because then it there becomes a conflict of interest. Indeed. Yeah, so what the committee does is, and once we get all the information in the office, uh, Ms. Ann Simons uh, and our team will collate all the information. Um, we do some research. If it's not enough information, we go and try to research it. Mm -hmm. And then what we'll do is that for each sport, we'll ask the National Sports Governing Body, is this athlete in good standing? If the National Sports Governing Body says they're in good standing, then they're included in the bond. If they're not, the names are pulled up. We're not telling the public that's the case, right? Because that's not, you know, we right. just deal with what we have. Right. But we we, we work with the national sports governor by through this, right? And um, and the committee has get the gets the information about two weeks before or a week before to review because it's a thick binder. Right. We have to review. Actually, it. It, last year was three weeks. Right. Yeah. 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 Because it was actual thick last year. Well, and and we and collectively we all said we were pleasantly yeah. surprised yeah. and happy with yeah. the fact that yes. persons in the community and yes. NSGB put forward put these forward these. athletes yes. because as I as I say to many NSGBs, mm -hmm. 
don't you have an award ceremony every year? Don't you pick an athlete of the yeah. year, male mm -hmm. and female? Yeah. So d don't you give out prizes for the, the well, person that helped, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. helped out the most? And you mm -hmm. have you have all these creative ideas yeah. for your own uh, awards. Why aren't you putting those people forward for to be recognized mm -hmm. nationally? Yeah. Whether you think somebody who gets up early in the morning and, and does road work for um, a triathlon or a cycle race or somebody that marks out a football field or even the groundsman that prepares a wicket mm -hmm. no matter how short notice you give them and if you're ready to recognize that individual yes. in your presentation then why isn't that person being put forward to the committee mm -hmm. to be recognized for their yeah. you know and a lot of them say well we, we just feel that the accomplishment isn't that as great as it is, but well, put it forward and let let the committee decide. Yeah, that's like the question I asked. Yes, yeah. Then you doubt you never know yeah. what can be accomplished mm -hmm. if you just put it forward. Just put it forward. Yeah. yeah. Well, Mr. Simons, we've come to the end of VSB Sports Talk. I do want to thank you for joining me here today. I do want to request to bring you back as we get into the. Uh, Hall of Fame and we get into closer to the end of the year um, and to talk about uh, the sports awards. Um, we do have the CAC games coming up so we get to talk yeah. about uh, okay. that after uh, November. So And it's quite a bit coming up. We have the Grand Slam next week. We have Girl Cup sailing. We're waiting on the announcement of the America's Cup which should come within the next two weeks I've been told. Um, well, yeah, I've been to it. <laughs> we have the Rugby Classic. We have several other golf events coming up. So it's a busy time for Bermuda mm -hmm. and, um, and and Bermudian athletes. Yeah. Um, so I do want to thank you once again for coming on and joining me here on VSP Sports Talk. And I look forward to having you in that seat sometime very soon in the very near future. Any Before parting I words? Retire. <laughs> <laughs> Any parting words? No, but thank you. I'm Mr. Bezos. Thank you. Uh, we're here to assist in any way we can. I know that you all and we can. And I think that I speak, I think highly of my staff who, if you ask them, they come. Mm -hmm. um, and who go about and be on the call of duty. And I think that a lot of, I'd like to send out my uh, kudos to all the national sports company bodies and those that are involved in sports because Sometimes it seems like a thankless task, but when you see your athletes excel, not only locally, but they go off and come back and be good citizens in the country, you've done extremely well. And uh, you know, some things you don't need to take on, and don't take away. So I encourage you to continue working hard. All right, well, thank you very much, sir, and do enjoy the rest of your day. Hi, my name is Earl Basden. Join me on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. on 1450 AM Gold for VSB Sports Talk to get all your sporting news. You will have the chance to hear about the many wonderful things our Bermudian athletes are doing both locally and abroad. That's Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays on 1450 AM Gold from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. for VSB Sports Talk with Earl Baisden.